Anytime you ever ask, I am there. We will do it. It is such a blessing to be here with you, to be with Union. I mean, our relationship is like 20 years in the making and <laughs> it right. always feels so fresh. And I'm so excited to dive into deep conversation with you, theological imaginaries and superhero yep. future casting joy. <laughs> so let's jump right in, Gabby. And so I want to start a minute with you and your story. As a queer Puerto Rican woman, a quirky Rican, as you have called yourself, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise also known you as a nerd, you say, growing up in the Bronx in what you called a morally controlled environment in the middle of chaos, mm -hmm. navigating what you describe as Catholic guilt, given your Catholic schooling, and evangelical fear, having grown up in a very religious Pentecostal evangelical household. So I want to ask you, how have you indeed navigated the Catholic guilt and Pentecostal fear that so many, especially queer people of color, find themselves trying to navigate even as they struggle to live as whole beings? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Easy Kelly, question. What a wild question, right? What a wild question. Um, <laughs> but there are so many answers, right? Like, I think first and foremost, coming up in, in my, my, my family home, uh, full of Puerto Ricans in the Bronx, my parents were very much into the Christian evangelical church. Um, and, and still there was something really joyful about my parents' relationship with God, where they were firm believers in that everyone has their own unique relationship with God and that God created us in God's image hmm. um, and God is love, right? So those three uh, ideas, those three beliefs were at the foundation. So not patriarchy, right? Not mm -hmm. control, um, not obedience, but like love. And hmm. I really, really firmly believe that that is how I was able to navigate everything that I navigated, right? So even when the church and even my mom, you know, she's come a long way, but even when I was presented with that homophobia and that, you know, um, you are gonna go to hell if you're gay, right? Yeah. And hell could happen at any moment because the rapture is like two right. minutes behind us. You right know what I mean? The corner. Like, right. There was always this really deep undercurrent of love and individual relationship with like Jesus Christ, right? Hmm. And so when I was coming out and when I was, holding all this fear, I held that belief as well. And, and I'll never forget, I was like 17 years old. I had spent two years praying the gay away. And I was like, God, I'm gonna ask you one more time. If I'm not supposed to be this way, let me wake up and not be gay anymore. Let me, I will, I don't want it. But if I wake up and I'm still the way that I am, I'm gonna take that as a sign that this is how you have crafted me to be. And so when I woke up the next morning and I was still <laughs> queer and nerdy and, and gay as the day is long, right? I was like, okay, done. And there was something there where like I absolved myself and I forgave mm -hmm. God, right? For everything that other people had said about God and about my salvation. And that was it. I was like, okay, that's all I need. And so I'm thankful for that because that love and that joy was like, was always the deepest root and the strongest root. Um, and the Catholic guilt and all that other stuff, I was able to reckon with it. Like another big story in my family was hearing Jesus talk about the Pharisees, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how there were people who were talking about God, but didn't really hold the principles of love thy neighbor and, and, and just like humility and, and peace, right? So I always just then circled back to that and was like, well, this is that Pharisee energy. <laughs> <laughs> right. This has nothing, this is not about me and my life. So I'm going to like continue on my path um, and hope that everyone can evolve. And, and, and that's it. Those were the lessons that I needed. So Gibby, I'm going to later get a little bit, get back a little bit to this joy thing. But let me ask you this real quick uh, before I take another turn. As you navigated that, 
And I'm I'm so struck by your understanding that the core of this was love, that you heard that message about love. And we like to say that the synonym for God is love, which makes all of this other stuff uh, that is contrary to that seem outside of the boundaries of, of talking about God or who God is. Did that mean, however, that as you navigated that, that you had to navigate your way out of the church in order to really, this institutionalized church and religion to really hold on to this God that was love? Yes. Yeah. Well, see, the church in my uh, my family's experience showed itself out the door, right? Because this mm -hmm. pastor was found to be embezzling, right? Mm -hmm. And was having inappropriate relationships with other women in the church, right? And so the pastor showed himself to be fallible. And my parents felt a lot of tremendous pain from that because I think for them, they really were trying to live those Christian values. Mm -hmm. And when the leader of the church failed them on so many levels um, with greed and with hypocrisy and judgment, they were like, no more. And so that also showed me, hey, it's like not about this place, this oh. place that is obsessed with like uh, gender presentations, right? Mm -hmm. Women are dressed like women to the point where they had rules for my mom that she had to wear stockings, she had to wear high heels, right? Men had to wear suits that were obsessed with like this idea of family and like um, morality, but not living those values. And so many churches that I went to after that felt the same way that here were these men who were put on these pedestals of like, what is real morality and what is, they're allowed to lead us but they are not living in that truth in those realities, right? They are very much flawed men, right? Living right. in capitalism, men of color who are doing the best that they can, but also trying to grab that power wherever they can. And so to me that it was like, I do not need to be part of this church. Also these churches do not have room for queer people. These churches do not have room for young people's sexuality and curiosity right. and like, you know, questions about God and so yeah very much you know I started finding church in the gay clubs right there's yeah. a whole different divine experience when you first see your first drag show as a freshly out queer kid and mm -hmm. everyone is living exactly how they want to live and loving on each other right mm -hmm. that is a whole other divine experience and so that that had to I had to stay away and I still continue to stay away from most churches because of that and even though now I do see that there are definitely more queer friendly churches there are queer people who are leading congregations and having their own ministries um but still uh you know I, I don't know what Bible verse it is, but I believe there's one about like churches wherever you are yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is church for us right here you know Right. No, I, I, I like that. And I think that's a message that the church, quote unquote, the institutionalized church must hear that, you know, in fact, you know, it's not that people and young people and other people are moving away from God. They're seeking God and and the church has moved away from God. Right. The right. Uh, And the, and and the God that is love. And so, that's right. And and moved away from God for sure. That's 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 exactly right. So Gabby, that leads me because this issue, you know, when we think about the church and the message of the church and uh the way in which the church in fact uh betrays uh who it claims to be as a reflection of this God that is love, these aren't simply theological issues, these are issues of life and death for many persons. In your, your first award-winning book, Julia Takes a Breath, was autobiographical, right? And it introduced you to the Marvel world as they tapped you to write America Chavez, uh, Marvel's first, again, queer Latino hero. And you have said of that, that visibility and representation is a life or death matter. Can you tell us what you mean by that and how that shaped the way in which you wrote America Chavez? Yes. Oh my gosh, Kelly. I mean, 
I, besides writing, I've also done a lot of uh, mentorship advocacy work at, with LGBTQ youth, right? Mm -hmm. And it is a wild thing to lead young people towards building the skills that they need to advocate for um, GSAs and gender neutral bathrooms and to provide a safe, loving space. And still, because of the hatred that young people experience at home, at church, in school, to lose children over mm -hmm. the course of a year, to turn mm -hmm. around and go from having 18 youth to having like 16 or 15, mm -hmm. literally losing them and them saying, I, I can't do this, I, am, I have to go, taking their own lives. And yet the ones that stay, right, remind me that like all of the things that we do matter. The ones that are able to hold on need that representation. They need to be able to see that there is a queer black superhero, that there is a disabled superhero, that there is a movie about queer kids that live to the end and 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 are loved, right? Like that's the stuff like that reminds them to stay rooted and allows their roots to connect with other people. And so writing Juliet, right, um, as I've said before, I was coming from a place where most of my ancestors died of HIV AIDS, right? We saw that in the 80s and 90s. Right, that's right. Not only did I see that as a young person, but I saw pastors, uh, newscasters, and everyday people saying, oh yeah, that's good for those gays. Yeah, those exactly. gays, they deserve that horrible mm -hmm. death. They don't deserve any care, right? Um, and so that made it seem like I would never have a good life. And when I was writing Juliet, I was like, I am mm -hmm. going to rebuke all of that. If nothing else mm -hmm. in the world tells you that you should live, you will live and it will be good, this mm -hmm. book will do that. And I made sure that Juliet's coming out was not apologetic, um, that she wasn't looking to pray her gay away, right? <laughs> that she was in it and excited <laughs> and, and vibrant and loved, right? Like her mom may have been like, I don't know about this gay stuff, but right. her mom loves her enough to like meet her where she's at. I wanted to offer that model for not just queer kids, but for parents of color who are like, dang, I do love my kid, but I've grown up in this church and I've grown up in this society that tells me that queerness is wrong. How do I meet my kid where they are? You know, mm -hmm. what if I don't have the language? What if I don't know what it means to be non-binary or trans or gender queer? None of that matters, right? It's about keeping the love on the table. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, being tapped by Marvel, um, they never asked me to shrink or to hide any of that queerness and that mm. platform, right. that platform alone to be able to run free with a story like America Chavez and have her explore her roots, have her have <laughs> drama with an ex-girlfriend, mm. have her like boxing in Vegas, mm. all sorts of wacky, zany, fun things. It's like soul altering. Because mm -hmm. that shows, to, that allows kids and our elders, right? Our elders who never really got to maybe That's enjoy right. the freedom of queerness, right? That you can be a queer person, you can have like LGBTQ like issues in your life, but you can also just be free to be on your adventures. You are free to love and to be loved. Yeah. So Gabby, as you talk about that, one, I'm trying to figure out what, what am I going to ask first? And, 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 and <laughs> but first, as you talk about that, one, it reminds me of something that I never thought of and, and your work and writing in Marvel. I didn't start reading uh, Marvel comics, really, Gabby, until you wrote <laughs> American Travel. Me neither, Kelly. Me and either. I said, oh, well, I guess <laughs> I got to read it because Gabby wrote it. Uh, and and <laughs> yes. so it's like, wow, okay. And and to see how comics can be a is an art form for expanding our moral imaginary. And you certainly did that through the comics. So I'm going to combine two questions. And and as you did that, something else happened because you were introduced to the world of comic skate, uh, uh, where you received death threats and you received all kind of hate mail and 
uh, in the universe of which people can send these things to the point that you wondered whether or not you should continue in this genre of writing. I mean, you were, it was so serious. You're, you know, having to report these things to the police. You were fearful for your life because you were writing about a Latina queer uh, uh, superhero and reminds me of the way people reacted to a black uh, uh, Disney character, right? And so you right. <laughs> so it reminds you. It reminds me of the power of comics. But here's where I want to say: all of this hate and really downtime and meaning down that you were down and depressed over these things, all of these death threats. You come out talking about joy <laughs> in the midst of all of this hate. And I am so was so moved to hear you uh, in one interview talking about, you know, how, you know, you you belong to a different pocket, a pocket of people who keep sort of love and joy alive. How in the world I can barely come through faith with faith and you come out talking about joy. How does that work, Gabby? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> You know, Kelly, it is also part of sitting with the ache, right? It's, it's, there's a part of it where you must, I had to really sit with the ache. I had to really sit with the fear and the pain um, and the shame, right? And embarrassment, uh, feeling like I had let everybody down, that I was letting myself down, feeling afraid, like they had my mom's information, like these people, right? They'll really come for you. Um, and feeling like I didn't want to do this, I didn't deserve to do this, and nobody wanted it, like sitting with that, right? And not just saying, oh, I'm a pivot to happiness, I'm a pivot to joy, because that pivot isn't real. It's like the process of moving through. Um, and what that process showed me was that like community is everywhere. <laughs> At the peak of that hate, I was getting invitations to mom and pop comic book shops. And I was scared to death to go, but I started going. And that's when I started meeting people, everyday people, white, black, Latino, Asian, old, young, queer, straight, whatever, gender. And people were like, we love this. This is so fun. Don't listen to those people. And it reminded me once again that this machine, right, this machine of, of internet, this machine of comments and even news and, and just this like white violent machine of, of media mm -hmm. is never meant to support us and is not the real world in a lot of respects. The real world, real people are these folks right here. And that's all, that is my only work. That is my wow. only care. And once I remembered that and saw that, that's why, I, that's when the pivot to joy uh, started to flourish. Um, and at the same time, right, while I'm writing America, 45 is president. Yeah. And in conversations with young people, college students, women who run business, everybody, nobody had joy. Everybody had fear, rage. This was when they were putting out the Muslim bans. He mm -hmm. was talking horribly about Mexicans, disabled people. Like there was this deep panic. Before the pandemic, there was this deep panic, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I started asking people, but what was joyful for you today or this week? Mm. It shifted everything in mm. the conversation. And that's when I was like, there's something here. There's something here, right? Because it is not an easy joy. It is not a joy that is like akin to organizing your closet, right? Okay. It is a joy that comes from that deep rooted ache, the, the mm. ache where you have been to the memorials and the funerals, the ache where you've had to go to the rallies and the riots for your rights and your humanity. And still when we come together in community, there is that holding joy, the joy that holds us together. Hmm. And that Kelly, like that is, that is the work, that is the ministry, that is the like jubilation, you know? <laughs> people have to appreciate that. So Gabby, 
what you've talked about and you've had a podcast and it's now called Joy Uprising. And uh, one of the highlights of uh, my life was being in one of those podcasts with you and talking about joy. And now in the previous called Joy Revolution, what's a joy upri- what's, what's a joy uprising look like? You know, it's so funny. I ask everybody that question. <laughs> so now you have to answer. <laughs> Um, you know, a joy uprising is, in essence, choosing love and choosing community. Mm. And not just community of people that like look like you, right? When I think of my joy uprising, I think of growing up in the Bronx mm-hmm. and we being Puerto Rican Christians, but next door was a uh, uh, Hindu folks from India, right? And then we're Pentecostal, but then next door was like Southern Black Baptist folks. And then across the street, our neighbors were from the West Indies and from Korea, right? Like, and my parents were always like, no matter what, everyone here is like a a child of God, protected by God's love, whatever they believe. Um, And our job is to, if someone is being racist against them our job is to stand with them and protect each other Hmm. so to me that is like the root of any sort of joy uprising or revolution is that we say we we choose each other and we choose love Hmm. um and i feel like that is something that every day this uh american media and 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 political climate wants to dismantle and actively seeks to bust up the way they bust up unions they are mm-hmm. busting up that like community uh, of love and 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 care between mm-hmm. us um and so that's why it's an uprising that's why it's a riot to choose each other and to choose joy yeah i you know it's like the power <laughs> of joy the power of joy that's rooted in love right and and i just like the way you always talk about you don't take those things off the table uh uh and you know and and the the challenge and the critique that some of our religious institutions have taken those things off the table and making them other than what they should be so gabby i get you out of here you and i could talk forever i'm gonna get you out of here on uh i'm in no la- rush kelly just keep me yeah. <laughs> can get you out of here. two last questions but i have to i have to say one thing as you were talking about joy that you didn't talk about and i want to ask what joy this bought you when you all the things that were happening to you uh surrounding your writing of uh, the america series uh you named the university that your uh uh, uh hero went to of uh, Sotomayor University, Sotomayor University, and must have been a particular moment of joy when you got a letter from Justice Sotomayor. Tell us about that and what that <laughs> meant to you. And, and here again, we're talking about visibility and representation, right? right. And having someone like Sotomayor uh, on on the bench, and she talked about how important it was having you uh, writing this series. Talk about that a little bit. I love that. Well, you know, before when I was writing Juliet, I was like unemployed, living in my mom's basement. Like there was no. Lately, there's this like push for like, oh, we need to find diverse writers. We got to make sure that we have uh, black authors and this, this, and that, and you know, we got to make sure that we are diversity and inclusion, all these things. But when I was writing Julia, there was nobody publishing like queer Latinas or, you know, anything like that. So I just was here writing this story Mm -hmm. on a hope and a prayer. And I was uh, in the libraries all the time. Libraries were free. Libraries are still free, right? And in my needing to find hope, I checked out uh, Sotomayor's memoir. Mm -hmm. And I was reading it and I'm like, oh my gosh, Here's this Puerto Rican from the Bronx. She literally grew up like two blocks away from my mom. Mm. Um, She was diabetic, right? I have asthma. And so here she is on her own, forging her own path. And I just took so much inspiration from her Mm. and from her story. And like, you know, 
she's not queer, but like there are moments in her memoir where her family's like pushing her to get married and pushing her to have kids. And she's like, well, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a justice, you know? And like, so there were moments where I was just like, okay, if this lady can do it, hmm. and she's from the same place at the same time as my mother, my family, myself, like I will do it. And so when I was imagining America's story and trying to find like, you know, like an easy entry point, like going to college, mm -hmm. I realized that there's no college in the nation that was like created for Latinas or queer people, right? Like, right. Um, and that, you know, the HBCUs that exist were literally because people were like, we need this, we are going to forge this through the fire, right? And, and that most institutions are geared for like white men to succeed. So I was like, what would a school for a queer Latina superhero be like? <laughs> and so I just had this image of like a holographic Sotomayor, like welcoming everybody <laughs> into her intergalactic university, you know? Um, and so that, and so when I received that letter from her because her interns had read America and then <laughs> kicked it up to her, <laughs> I was like, look at the universe <laughs> look at look at how from going from thinking that I would I wasn't sure if I would ever amount to anything right mm -hmm. um and just not because of lack of trying but because of lack of space for folks like mm -hmm. me in the world look where I have come look how far I've come and then look at my mentors finding me and being inspired by this work like what a wild concept mm -hmm. um it was really galvanizing you know and really exciting yeah I mean, we could end there and that's a good place to end but i know folks are we promised we would hear from a marvel writer and want something about your thoughts of Wakanda forever that is on its way and you love talking about it and because i'm also struck how significant uh, the Black Panther was for the Black community, particularly young youth uh, or youth and young Black people, and uh, and how you've spoken about the importance of things like uh, America. Uh, and so what do you hope to see What's in Wakanda forever? What do you hope happens? I mean, first of all, I just love to see Angela Bassett, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like what? Like, and everything that she does, I feel like she is just such a force and a blessing, right? And then just with Black Panther and Wakanda, uh, overall, I just, you know, I want to say something to Latinos because Latinos are quick to be like, oh, well, where's our Black Panther? Mm -hmm. And I really want to like push back against that rhetoric because it's like completely unfair to like Afro-Latinos, right? And it also, it's like a takeaway. They want to take away something. Mm -hmm. And I want to push and be like, we need to really get on board with uh, when Black people win, we all win. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and that to me is something really exciting about Black Panther is mm -hmm. that, it depicts this world that I like, I mean, I want to live in, right? Like I want that to be the world, you know? I want to see like black scientists being put to the forefront and developing new ways for us to explore the universe, right? So that something as vast as the universe doesn't always have to come from a place of like white supremacy and exploration and colonization, right? When I see, um, Black Panther in this, you know, with the vibranium and it's this resource that belongs to them solely that they are able to utilize. I think of all the ways that reparations need to be given immediately for all that which was taken, right? <laughs> from like uh, black countries, from Africa, from the West Indies, from everywhere, you know? And so the so Black Panther movies are like this wild, revolution of joy in and of themselves you know what I mean um and that that is the most exciting part and like you know I love being in partnership I, I have my partner her name's Anna Yvette we both are politically and like uh revolutionary in the same way and so she's another Latina who is absolutely like dedicated to that excitement where like when the black community wins we all win and like 
our job is to uplift, support, and be excited. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm excited. You know? Yeah, like, and, yeah, and we're all excited waiting for that. And Gabby, I think you you you've answered this question, but in what you've just said, and we'll go out on this. You know, as you talk about Black Panther, you talk about America, and you talk about these uh, uh, this genre of of of, of art of sci fi, if you will, and and traveling these futurist. Uh, sort of films and and comic, what and the worlds that they describe. What is the role of Marvel and the comics and these series, especially in the world in which we are living? What is their role in helping us? to get to that more just future mm. where joy, as you have described it, is not simply on the table, but it's at the center. Mm. Kelly, I think there's a beautiful question and we also gotta be really careful, right? Because we're talking about corporate entities. We're talking about Marvel, we're talking about Disney. We're talking about entities where the real bottom line is the accumulation of wealth, <laughs> right? Um, right? And so I would love to say that the role of Marvel and things and like Disney is to continue the inclusion mm -hmm. at, at best, right? At the, the least that can be done from those entities, right? Is to continue the inclusion, to make more Black Panther movies, to do, do America Chavez, to have the disabled superheroes, the indigenous superheroes, right? To widen the Marvel universe to include everyone, right? Everyone in the fight for justice and revolution. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, what I know, what I really believe in is that when our kids see that, when our elders see that, it allows us to tap into our imagination. Mm. Because we are the ones that really do the future casting. We are the ones that say, this world is not enough. We need our worlds to look like this. And so I hope that the, you know, abundance of Marvel movies doesn't just like say, we're going to do the imagining for you. I hope that it continues to inspire every person to like imagine that greater future. Imagine the superheroes that we need, that we want, that will make this world better and like eventually create our own, create mm -hmm. our own means of production, create our own version of Marvel and this and that, you know what I mean? Um, to, to really center that joy and that justice. It's like, yes, and, you know? Gabby Rivera, <laughs> <laughs> this conversation today for me has been a joy uprising. Mm -hmm. And I hope that it has been that for all those who have listened. Thank you, Gabby, for the work that you were doing. Thank you for the joy that you were certainly bringing into this world. Thank you for this conversation. Kelly, I love you so much. Thank you to you and thank you to Union for having me. And uh, these conversations are so wonderful and so needed. Have the best day. You too.